morning, I'd like for you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the 14th chapter of the book of Genesis. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 14. Now for um, a few weeks, we have been doing something that um, I have wanted to share with you for some time, and uh, the Lord has allowed us to do it at this time. And that is taking the Christmas season with reference to the birth of our wonderful Lord. And these days, which we celebrate uh, the coming of the Lord and observing some of the wonderful prophecies of the Old Testament, how they've come into reality during the Christmas season. Now, so many... Uh, do, do not uh, know of these things. In fact, I was not aware of them for a number of years, and I got just a little bit disturbed with myself, as well as time that I do some finding now. And so <clears throat> I've uh, had a burden that uh, other believers might know uh, just the greatness and the extent and the expanse of spiritual blessing that the Bible speaks about concerning the Christmas season. So many times it's just all wrapped up in tinsel and glitter and all of this, but there are so many, many wonderful things that are associated with the Christmas season, particularly with the coming of the Lord Jesus. And uh, <clears throat> we have been putting these things on the board, but since we have given you most of them, I only have one or two more left, and then I want to do a little something different. In Genesis chapter 14, beginning with verse 17 and um, <clears throat> going down through verse 20, we have an account in the Old Testament times when Abraham was uh, alive, living in the land of Palestine, and he had a separation with Lot, his nephew. Lot was one of these a kind of individuals that had his eyes glued on things of the world, and he chose to go from Abraham down into the valley, well-watered plain near Sodom and Gomorrah, and there's where he lived. A very, very wicked place, as we discover it throughout the pages of Scriptures, And there was an occasion when there were a group of kings in that particular area uh, went to war. And they went to war with the kings in that particular valley in which uh, Lot lived. And lo and behold, they took him captive. And so <coughs> news came back to Abraham in the land of Palestine <coughs> that... Uh, uh, Lot was taken captive by these kings. And so Abraham summons his uh, uh, men together, got quite an army, and they went after him. And sure enough, uh, they <coughs> conquered the kings and brought Lot back. And as they were coming back, here's where we take up with the story in the 14th chapter. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him, that is Abraham, after his return from the socks of Tabor the Homer, and the kings that were with him in the valley of Shaveh, which is the king's David, and, I notice this, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he, referring to Abraham, and he, Abraham, gave him Melchizedek the tithes of all. Now, this title, Melchizedek, is rather a prominent title throughout Scripture. 
and it has a very vital bearing upon the person of the Lord Jesus who was born there in the manger of Bethlehem so many years ago. And in order for us to find out something about the relationship of the Lord Jesus to Melchizedek, we need to take our Bibles now <clears throat> and turn to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. So if you take your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Hebrews. Let's see if we can discover some very interesting truths concerning this man Melchizedek and the Lord Jesus. Turn to Hebrews chapter 6 and 7, a very, very important portion of the Word of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 7. Now, in the last verse of the sixth chapter of the book of Hebrews, we read some very interesting words. Whether the forerunner is for us and entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, here I'm introduced to the fact that the Lord Jesus has become and was made a priest. But the Lord Jesus' priesthood was a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. Now, there may be a lot that we do not understand concerning the Old Testament with reference to the matter of the priest and the priesthood, which was the order of ministry for the children of Israel. Well, that need not disturb us a great deal, with exception of this point, that the children of Israel, uh, they had uh, a religion, Judaism, and it centered around Jehovah, and they had a little temple, and there were a number of ordinances with reference to this temple, and they had priests that ministered for them as a nation and as a people. Now, <coughs> there was an entire tribe set aside to be the tribe of priests. But, we come to this man's name, Melchizedek, and we find him to be a priest. And he is one that came out to meet Abraham in the Old Testament after uh, Abraham uh, rescued Lot. And then I see that the Lord Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, immediately, we are entering into the matter of a Judaistic religion in the Old Testament of a man that ministered before God and his ministry was that called the ministry of Melchizedek. All right, let's find out something more about this Melchizedek. First of all now, I know, I know Melchizedek's a priest. And I find out that the Lord Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now in chapter 7 we read these words. For this Melchizedek... King of Salem. <coughs> King of Salem. Well, now that's interesting. Here's a priest who is a king. And it says, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed Abraham, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. First, being by interpretation, now notice some things about this particular priest, Melchizedek, king of Salem, king of righteousness. And after that also, king of Salem, which is king of peace. All right, let's stop for just a moment and sort of tie these things together. Now then, <clears throat> I understand from this passage, along with the 14th chapter of the book of Romans, that Melchizedek is a priest. Secondly, I find that he is a king from a place called Salem. Now then, I understand 
that this person is a king that has a couple of characteristics. He is a king called king of righteousness, and he is a king that's called king of peace. Now then, See something with reference to the Lord Jesus? The Lord Jesus is spoken of as being a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek being not only a priest, but also a king. And a king who's a king of righteousness, and a king who's king of peace. The Lord Jesus then being, after the order of this individual, a priest who is a king, king of righteousness, king of peace. Let's go on. Verse 3 tells me something else. Without father, <coughs> without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now then, when you come to the 14th chapter of the book of Genesis, as we just read, we were just simply introduced to the individual. Isn't that right? There wasn't any background at all given to us about Melchizedek. Now then, the Bible tells us why. Because there was specific design that we should know nothing about Melchizedek except that he was a priest and that he was a particular king. And since there isn't any mention with reference to lineage or anything, then the scriptures liken that to the reality of the character of the Lord Jesus being an eternal priest. That is what is being emphasized here. Abideth a priest continually. Now then, let me go to verse 17 of this same chapter in the book of Hebrews. Verse 17 through 22. And see if we can uh, more or less just get some confirming things here. For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, speaking of the Lord Jesus. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and the unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And insomuch as not without an oath he was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever. Forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now we read that in chapter 6, verse 20. We're simply emphasizing, aren't we, the eternal aspect of who the Lord Jesus is. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better covenant. Now, there's so many things that we could speak about in this connection. But what we want you to see is that the Old Testament speaks of an individual by the name of Melchizedek. Now, you come to the New Testament, and you find the New Testament likening the Lord Jesus to this person of the Old Testament called Melchizedek and speaking of the Lord Jesus in this frame of reference three great things he is a priest he is an eternal priest and he brought in a much better order an order in this regard he is an eternal king priest righteousness and peace. Now, have we not noticed something in our study? 
we have observed haven't we <coughs> that the Lord Jesus speaking of birth of Christ among the many things which we will not list we have noticed in this connection he's a priest we have also observed that the Lord Jesus is a prophet. We've also observed that he is a king. Now you can take the Old Testament reference as Genesis chapter 14 and the New Testament reference as Hebrews chapter 6 and 7 in this connection. Now as far as a prophet, you can remember Deuteron Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 18 verses 15 and 19 along with Acts chapter 3 what did we have Acts chapter 3 verse 23 I believe it is let me just uh, look at it uh, for our reference please Acts chapter 3 <sighs> Acts chapter 3 verse 22 uh, down through 26. Now there are so many, many references with reference to the Lord Jesus as being king. But one of the interesting things which we noticed last time was in Numbers, Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. And you remember what that particular verse had to say? A star would arise out of Jacob scepter would come out of Israel. And then in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, I believe it was, verse 2, you remember the wise men coming from the east came to Jerusalem and asked the question, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Why did they come with that message? They went ahead and stated, For we have seen his star in the east. Him. Very, very interesting to observe that in Matthew chapter 2, when you are referring to uh, that particular incident of the star, the first mention was not the, the wise men saying, we have seen a star. No. We have seen his star. His star. And then the other three mentions of the star throughout Matthew chapter, chapter th uh, uh, 2, the star, the star, the star, referring back to the first mention <coughs> of the star as his star. Star. So, take a look now at what we have on the blackboard, the Lord Jesus at birth, a priest, a prophet, and a king. A number of years ago, I received a letter from a man, and I had just started out in uh, somewhat of a concentrated effort on prophecy, that he uh, uh, gave me a note of blessing concerning the threefold office of the Lord Jesus, prophet, priest, and king. And I asked myself, is that prophecy? Is that prophecy? The office of the Lord, prophet, priest, and king. Was that prophesied in the Old Testament? Was it? It sure was. I had to do a little scratching. Although I had been introduced to it in my studies and all this, and you know what happens when you study. <laughs> You, you, you just simply can't. You just simply can't mass the whole bit of information, can you? You just get enough to get by, and then hope some will stick. Well, this particular area didn't stick until 
I started doing some study. And it was so wonderful to me, so wonderful to me, later on, to do study whereby, whereby I got a much broader scope of the meaning of Christmas. That type that time of the season that we celebrate so much, and that is with reference to the person of the Lord Jesus. Come on in, folks. Find your chair here. It's good to have you. With reference to what the Old, Old Testament Scriptures prophesy. Now, we have noticed, haven't we, that the Scriptures told us where he was to be born in the Old Testament in Micah 5. We was to be born in Bethlehem. Well, that's certainly confirmed in the New Testament, isn't it? We also discovered how he was to be born in Isaiah 7, 14, that he was to be born of a virgin. Well, we find that confirmed in Matthew 1, 23. And then we noticed a number of other things with reference to who he was to be. He was to be God with us. He was to be the Savior. But we've, we've dealt with those. But the thing that I wanted you to see was the fact that Jesus Christ, that little babe in the manger of Bethlehem, manger of Bethlehem, was far more than just a little babe that was to be celebrated from a traditional point of view such as the carols and such as all of the ornaments and so forth down the line. Because there are a number of things associated with the Christmas season which we do maybe traditionally that we are not aware of the great biblical significance. And particularly, have I been struck with the reality of the star? So many of our decorations involve the star, isn't that right? Well, why the star? Well, it's because of the account of the star given in Matthew chapter 2. But what's the significance of that star? The significance of that star, dear people, is the fact that a king, a king was born over and over and over again you find the emphasis that the babe, the babe in the manger of Bethlehem, was born the king in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. If I were to give you a great significant passage of the Old Testament that would sort of act as a capstone for all of this, do you know what passage I would give you? I would give you Isaiah. 9, 6, and 7. That right there would be the great <coughs> key. Would you take your Bibles and turn with me now back to the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. <coughs> chapter 9, verse 6 and verse 7. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. I find in Isaiah 9, 6 that all that is to be, uh, I mean 9, 6, and 7, all that is to be accomplished is to be accomplished by virtue of the one who's able to accomplish it. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will what? 
He'll perform it. He'll perform it. This passage is just simply jam-packed full of two great truths that have such a vital bearing. First of all, a child. Secondly, a son. Now then, as a child is to be born, that speaks of his humanity because he came as a bona fide human child. Isn't that right? He was born as a baby. So here you have his humanity. But when you speak of a son is given, when you come to uh, Luke chapter 1, he should be called the son of the highest. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. You have here deity. Deity involved. The great, great miracle of Christmas was that a God-man came up on the scene in the form of a babe. Why did he do it? <coughs> he did it because there could only be the God-man that could fill fulfill all of the truth of the Old Testament that zeroed in upon the hope and the fulfillment mentioned in the New Testament. And it takes God to do that. The Lord of hosts will perform this. There isn't any man that's going to do it. There isn't any group of men going to do it. I don't care how long you look or whatever may be your aspirations or anticipations. It's certainly not going to be some preacher. It's certainly not going to be some uh, government. Uh, you keep naming them. It's only the Lord of hosts that's going to do it. And he's going to do it through this one called the God-man who has the office of being priest, who has the office of being prophet, who has the office of being king. But now listen. Every one of those offices which have a great bearing for Israel, have a tremendous bearing for the Gentile also. For all humanity, Jew and Gentile, must zero in on one person, the Lord Jesus. just in light of our study this morning, the priest. He is a king, isn't he? He certainly is. A prophet in light of Acts 3. He shall be a blessing to all of the nations. The last part of the Gospel of Matthew, having gone forth to disciple all the Gentiles. And then that wonderful portion in Luke 2, from Simeon and Anna, that the redemption of Israel has arrived, who shall, who will be a great light that shines in the darkness and turn the Gentiles unto the, unto the peace. Listen, he's a king. And so much as it says the government shall be upon his shoulder, and he shall order it. But he's a king of righteousness, and he's the king of peace. Have you ever stopped to meditate upon this business of peace? Have you? The Christmas story has with it the message from the angels. Glory to God in the highest, and upon earth peace, goodwill among men which isn't a good translation. Glory to God in the highest and, on, and upon earth, peace among men of goodwill. There is no peace to the wicked, saith my God, and there never will be. Stop, and let's just ask ourselves today one question. Is there peace among the nations today? 
Oh, we can point our fingers at the frailties of that government, that government, that political party, that political party, this man, that man. And oh, we can, we can do all of these things, can't we? But why isn't there peace? And that's going to be one of the... And, and, and haven't you heard that? I've heard that from politicians from the time I was a little boy. We're going to bring in peace. We're going to bring in peace. And there was supposed to be a war. To end all wars, to bring in peace. Isn't that right? And World War II, and I was in that thing too. And that was to secure areas of government for greater peace. Huh. Peace comes, and there's only peace that will come when there's one who will be a ruler of peace. The Lord Jesus says, My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. In order for there to be peace, there has to be peace from a king who is a king of righteousness. Now it doesn't mean we cannot individually have peace. But all, oh, listen, I know precisely who is going to bring peace. A child is born, a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. He shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father. Folks, Christmas time guarantees for us that particular person. Why? Because all of the Old Testament spoke about it. The New Testament confirms it implicitly. I'm thankful for the great Christmas season. And all of this comes into focus in such a wonderful and precious manner. You can have peace personally. But from the time now until the time he comes, men will talk peace. There will be one peace treaty after another. There will be one peace conference after another mention. There will not be peace. Pessimistic? No. A realist with great optimism. Because I know I can have peace of heart and mind now as an individual. And one of these days, I'm coming back to earth <coughs> with a king who shall reign in peace. The Old Testament pro promises it. The New Testament confirms it. So there's so much wrapped up in the blessedness of the Christmas season. And I trust with all my heart that this season has meant a little more for you. And from here on out, we'll mean a little more for you because of the magnitude and the greatness of the person of the Lord Jesus. Take your Bibles. Study your Bibles. Let your Bible introduce you to Him where you can have that preciousness of personal peace and can know, can know who will bring peace and when peace will come upon such a needy, needy world for universal peace. But oh, listen, let's be busy sharing the fact that there can be individual peace.